Well, welcome everybody to this, the Adjudication Society lecture on the Construction Act. Our speaker this evening is Alexander Nissen QC. As many of us will know, Alexander has been involved in very many of the seminal cases involving adjudication and the Construction Act. To list a couple of examples, from 2001, the Disgain v OPEC prime development case, which I think looked at the early, uh, one of the early cases looking at breach of natural justice. 2007, Mott McDonald and London and regional properties, which I guess looked at a number of things, including whether an adjudicator could impose a lien to, to secure payment of his fees before releasing the decision. And more recently, a series of cases around Grove, Grove Developments and Balfour Beatty. Alexander became Queen's Counsel in 2006, was appointed Head of Chambers, Keating Chambers in 2020. Lord Justice Coulson at the Society of Construction Law inaugural conference held November 2019, made the comment that Alexander Nissen was Mr. Adjudication. He is therefore on many levels the perfect speaker this evening to deliver this important lecture looking at the first 25 years of the Construction Act. Alexander? Hey Mish, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it uh, did seem for a moment there that my life was flashing past me. Um, uh, it is now uh, 25 years since the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act was enacted. Pointedly, the title of this talk poses the question whether it is time for a silver jubilee. Should we bring out the trestle tables, union jack bunting and endless supplies of Victoria sponge? Or should we quietly note the date, keep calm and carry on? You'll be pleased to hear that this talk is not intended as an academic summary of the key milestone cases. There are eminent textbooks and other articles which can provide you with all that information. Uh, rather, my intention this evening is to stand back, to, to reflect on the adjudication process and take a look at the things that have worked well and those which are ripe for improvement. Although I will be reading a few extracts from judgments, uh, I've decided not to screen share them because I would then just disappear into a corner of your screen for far too long. The Act provides two complementary ways of unlocking payment. First, a series of payment provisions which require timely notice to be given of the amount to be paid. Second, the dispute resolution process of adjudication, which enables disputes about valuation, or indeed anything else, to be summarily determined on a tempor temporarily binding basis. The right to suspend was also provided for, but in my experience is rarely threatened and seldom used. Beyond saying that it was better to have provided for the right than not to have done so, I I'm not going to say anything more about suspension. We've lived with the Act for so long that it's easy to forget that its drafting is actually pretty poor. We all now know how it works, for which we have the courts, uh, rather than, if I may say so, the parliamentary draftsmen to thank. Even the payment provisions introduced in the 2009 amendments are hopelessly difficult to follow. Uh, I say that, I'm a construction lawyer. The survey conducted by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, who I will refer to as BAYS for short, uh, that department uh, survey recorded an astonishing 58% of participants who believe the payment framework was unclear or very unclear. My own experience uh, in court is that it is always necessary to paraphrase the provisions or explain how they are intended to work, rather than to point to the words actually used. Despite those grumbles, we now have a substantial body of developed case law dealing with those provisions and indeed adjudication more broadly, so that the principles are well established 
and happily the industry knows how to deploy them. If imitation is regarded as a form of flattery, the adjudication process has been adopted in other sectors too. The most obvious example is PFI contracts, not otherwise subject to statutory adjudication, which have invariably uh, included adjudication as either the first or second rung of the tiered dispute resolution process. Moreover, only last week, Mr. Justice Fraser handed down judgment in a case called BT Passive Norse against NPS property consultants, uh, in which he recommended a voluntary adjudication scheme run by the Professional Negligence Bar Association. Uh, he referred to that as having been relaunched in 2017 uh, and said that if it, if it had been used in that case, would have led to an experienced Queen's Council in the field, considering the claims and given it is not statutory adjudication, issuing a non-binding decision. He pointed out it is supported by the insurance industry amongst others. It is a great pity that the parties did not adopt that method of resolving their dispute in this case. It would have been far quicker, much more economical than conducting a high court trial, which lasted over three weeks, uh, with all the costs to the parties that such a trial entails. Even though there were contested issues of fact, adjudications can in suitable cases proceed with oral evidence and cross-examination of witnesses. Using the scheme to which I have referred to resolve such a dispute as this one would have been a far better way for the parties to have proceeded. In respect of a 25 year adjudication overview, the recent Supreme Court's decision in Bresco Electrical Services and Michael J. Lonsdale is of course as good a place to start as any. Speaking for the court, Lord Briggs summarized the purpose of adjudication in this way. A very important underlying objective, both of adjudication and of other recommendations which were eventually implemented in the 1996 Act, was the improvement of cash flow to fund ongoing works on construction projects. A particular concern was that a dispute between, say, a subcontractor and a sub-subcontractor, which could only be resolved by litigation or arbitration, could, in the meantime, disrupt the entire project while a refusal of interim payment led to the cessation of significant works. The motto, which has come to summarize the recommended approach, is pay now, argue later. In circumstances where the adjudication decision is viewed as a temporarily binding one, all subject to final determination, all of this, of course, makes good sense. Absent a regime for adjudication, the unpaid contractor could not easily have recovered payment against a recalcitrant employer. In the bad old days, it was not difficult for the paying party to conjure up complaints of defects or delay which had sufficient evidential support to overcome a summary judgment application and thereby keep the receiving party out of his money unless he was prepared to risk a full-blown trial 18 months down the line. Rather than letting the paying party unilaterally determine that he should hold the disputed funds pending trial, it makes obvious good sense for the question as to who holds the money in the meantime to be vested in someone who can look at the merits of the dispute and come to a provisional view of the outcome. If you see adjudication in that way, it is undoubtedly an improvement on what was the status quo and is surely the key attraction of the process. On any view, adjudication has successfully fulfilled the purpose of unlocking cash flow. Indeed, as Lord Briggs pointed out in Bresco, one of the benefits of adjudication is simply that it exists, even if not deployed. He said, furthermore, the availability of adjudication as of right has meant that many disputes are speedily settled between the parties without even the need to invoke the adjudication process. In C. Spencer against MW High Tech Projects, Lord Justice Coulson said, and I quote, the act has been, on any view, a considerable success. Returning to Lord Briggs's observations, he explained the success of the adjudication process in this way. 
It is achieved by rigorous time limits for the conduct of the adjudication, the provisionally binding nature of the adjudicator's decision, and the readiness of the courts, and in particular the TCC, to grant speedy summary judgment by way of enforcement, leaving any continuing disagreement about the merits of the underlying dispute to be resolved at a later date by arbitration, litigation, or settlement agreement. So in overview, it is fair to say that the system has the seal of approval from the highest appellate courts, and that should be regarded as a cause for celebration. So I want to now move on to consider some of the features lying behind that shiny endorsement. My first heading is a rigged system, question mark. I mentioned earlier that it is surely better for the question as to who holds the money in the interim to be decided by an independent third party than it was to allow the payer simply to hold on to the money pending trial. This notion presupposes that the decision is made by the independent third party in a structurally fair way. But ask anyone whether they genuinely think that the adjudication process starts from such a neutral position, and the answer will surely be that it does not. Let us consider just some of the built-in advantages given to a referring party right from the get-go. One, in the words of Sir Peter Coulson in his excellent book, the courts have been relatively quick to conclude that a claim or assertion that has gone unanswered, even for a comparatively short time, was one which was disputed for the purposes of the Act. In other words, it is really quite easy to demonstrate that a given dispute can be said to have crystallised. Two, unless pre-selected by the contract, the claiming party has a huge choice of adjudicator nominating bodies from whom to go in order to select the adjudicator. If it suits him to have a lawyer, he goes to Texa or Techbar. If a QS is preferred, he can go to RICS. These choices of forum are simply not given to the responding party. Third, whereas in court, a party must usually bring all his claims forward at once, a referring party can pick and choose. He can define the scope of his dispute entirely as he wants, subject only to making sure that in doing so, he does not shut out any legitimate defenses. But he can choose the topic. He wants to limit it to a particular payment application or a particular extension of time claim, is free to do so. Four, ambush. There is no conceptual limit on the volume of material that can be presented. Provided you can find an adjudicator who will not resign, you have all the time you want to prepare your claim and the responding party has just seven or 14 days in which to respond. Five, whereas forum shopping in court is impermissible, if things don't appear to be going according to plan, for whatever reason, Lanes and Galliford Try confirms that the referring party can simply pull the plug and start again in the hope of finding a more satisfactory adjudicator. Six, and perhaps the most important of all, the overwhelming majority of jurisdictional objections fail. The courts will generally find a way of ensuring that the adjudicator did have jurisdiction to decide what he or she did, and they will seldom restrain an ongoing adjudication. There are doubtless many more examples of the inbuilt advantage that a referring party has. You may think that this is just as it should be. Even with those one-sided advantages, it is still all better than leaving the money in the hands of and at the whim of the paying party. And I largely agree with that. But in my view, this imbalance needs to be recalibrated during the process itself. It is trite, but I will remind you that section 1082 requires contracts to ensure that adjudicators act impartially, 
and in default, paragraph 12 of the scheme requires the same. Adjudicators are to act in accordance with relevant terms of the contract and the law. Thus, the law, the statutory law mandates that once appointed, adjudicators should do their best to reach the decision in a fair and impartial way. The fact, if you see it this way, that the structure or architecture of the process is already rigged in favor of the referring party must not therefore be carried through to the decision-making phase of the process. In blunter terms, there should be no presumption that the referring party is entitled to something simply because of the very existence of the act designed as it is to improve cash flow. Here, I recognize I am walking on thin ice. In other contexts, the phrase unconscious bias has now entered our dialogue but I venture to suggest that elements of it apply here too. In my view and experience, there is from time to time an element of unconscious bias within our community, which presupposes an entitlement to payment on the part of the referring party, which a proper analysis would show is not really justified. The duty to decide matters independently and fairly is and must remain paramount. Indeed, the integrity of the process depends on claims being properly tested and analysed. It is all too easy to set up a contractor's claim, which is difficult to demolish on paper within a short timescale, but which, given a full trial, could have been forensically and analytically destroyed. An adjudicator tasked with acting in accordance with the relevant terms of the contract and the law must therefore approach the task by considering how the case is likely to be decided at a trial, because at a trial is when the law becomes established. My next heading is finality. Adjudication was designed to give rise to a decision which is merely temporarily binding. In Macob against Morrison, Mr. Justice Dyson, as he then was, said this. The intention of Parliament in enacting the Act was plain. It was to introduce a speedy mechanism for settling disputes and construction contracts on a provisional interim basis and requiring the decisions of adjudicators to be enforced pending the final determination of disputes by arbitration, litigation or agreement. See section 1083. He then said, Parliament has not abolished arbitration and litigation of construction disputes. It has merely introduced an intervening provisional stage in the dispute resolution process. Crucially, it has made clear that decisions of adjudicators are binding and are to be complied with until the dispute is finally resolved. But as we've come to learn, the reality is quite different. Most parties live with the decision and the final resolution stage is never called upon to serve. Lord Briggs in Bresco again said this. It was designed to be, and more importantly has proved to be, a mainstream dispute resolution mechanism in its own right, producing the de facto final resolution of most of the disputes which are referred to an adjudicator. This is in part because Parliament chose to confer the right to adjudicate at any time so that it can be and is used to resolve disputes, e.g. about final accounts between the parties after practical completion rather than merely at the interim stage. Well, I would quibble with the idea that adjudication was designed to be the de facto final resolution of disputes, but there's no doubt that it is ultimately it has ultimately proved to, to have had that purpose. Lord Briggs noted a 2004 article in Building, which quoted that only around 2% of adjudication decisions have since been challenged in the courts. Other statistics do not appear available to confirm this figure, but certainly the picture is of most adjudication decisions achieving a de facto final resolution of the underlying dispute and that appears clear. What are the reasons for this? Does it mean 
that parties are generally satisfied that the adjudicator has got the right answer most of the time. Well, I'll quote from Meadowside Building Developments and 12 to 18 Hill Street Management, uh, in which Mr. Adam Constable said this uh, in words endorsed by Lord Briggs. Adjudication is often about achieving a quicker and cheaper resolution to the party's disputes. Where one party regards an adjudicator's decision as a real miscarriage of justice, it has the right to take the dispute to litigation or arbitration, to have that dispute effectively overturned. Where, as is so often the case, the parties regard the decision as a decent attempt to arrive at a fair resolution of the competing positions, the parties generally treat the decision as binding or negotiate a settlement around it. This is good for the overall administration of justice, and no doubt many cases which would otherwise end up in the TCC are resolved without burdening public resources as a result of the practical utility of, ut of adjudication, notwithstanding its temporary nature. So the judicial line is that adjudication decisions are often seen as a decent attempt to arrive at a fair resolution of the competing positions. I'm sure that is so, but how often is often? I doubt it constitutes the whole or even most of the 98% of cases that apparently never get challenged by way of final resolution in the courts. So what other reasons are there for parties accepting the adjudication decision as the de facto final resolution. As far as I'm aware, there isn't much, much feedback or research from the industry which gives any clear answer to that question. A realistic consideration is simply that the story will have moved on. The interim payment in dispute is followed by a final account process governed by entirely different considerations. Having become embroiled in one adjudication, whatever its outcome, the parties may each take a more realistic attitude to dispute resolution um, during the final um, process. But there are other commercial factors at play. Business organisations need decisions to be taken in the interest simply of being able to move on. Provision in year-end accounts for unresolved claims are generally not a desirable thing. A decision which may be right or wrong, nonetheless allows parties to draw a line under the dispute and bring it to an end. Then there are the key participants to think about, players who in the crystallization of dispute may have taken good or bad positions. Those not directly involved, of course, can take a broader view. After the adjudication, the winners can regard themselves as vindicated and the losers can, at least if they have the nerve, hold their heads up high within the company and blame the adjudicator for a rogue decision. But that way, senior management, not directly or closely involved in the case, will simply decide to move on rather than litigate. They can say someone neutral has looked at it and decided. Where these factors arise, they are not, therefore, endorsements of the correctness of the decision, but are based solely on the fact that the decision exists. There is therefore something of a disconnect between the purpose for which adjudication was intended and the use to which it is frequently put. The existence of this disconnect should be a cause for concern. And, and yet it is not one that is, or indeed ever could be recognized by the courts. The disconnect arises because in robustly enforcing the decisions, the TCC routinely makes the point that the process is intended as a quick and dirty one, though perhaps not expressing it in quite those uh, terms. As Mr. Justice Dyson memorably put it in MACOB, the timetable for adjudication is very tight many would say unreasonably tight and likely to result in injustice. Parliament must be taken to have been aware of this. He said much the same in Buig and Dahl Jensen. Quote, as I said in Macon, the purpose of the scheme 
is to provide a speedy mechanism for settling disputes in construction contracts on a provisional interim basis and requiring the decisions of adjudicators to be enforced pending final determination of disputes by arbitration, litigation or agreement, whether those decisions are wrong in point of law or fact. It is inherent in the scheme that injustices will occur because from time to time, adjudicators will make mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes will be glaringly obvious and disastrous in their consequences for the losing party. The victims of mistakes will usually be able to recoup their losses by subsequent arbitration or litigation, and possibly even by a subsequent adjudication. And it was said by Lord Justice Chadwick in the well-known case of Carillion and Devonport Royal Dockyard that the need to have the right answer has been subordinated to the need to have an answer quickly. So the law of adjudication therefore presumes that mistakes will be made from time to time. The adjudicator is free to make patent errors of fact or law. None would do so by design, but many will have done so inadvertently, simply because of the limitations of time imposed by the process. Moreover, the crucial step of disclosure has not taken place. So neither party is required to reveal documents adverse to the case that they either advance or defend. And we all know from experience that, for example, internal disclosure can be very revealing. In my view, knowledge that parties are most likely to treat the decision as finally determinative of the dispute brings with it additional responsibilities on the part of the adjudicator. I would therefore encourage adjudicators making their decisions to bear in mind that those decisions are likely to have long-term impact well, beho- well beyond their much heralded provisional effect. How might that be done? Well, the powers are all there in the act and the scheme. The adjudicator may take the initiative in ascertaining the facts and the law necessary to determine the dispute. In my experience, this facility is underused. The initiative may, for example, be deployed to request any party to the contract to supply him with such documents as he may reasonably require. Thus, probing for adverse documents, including internal disclosure, is likely to be very informative, yet it is rarely exercised as a power. In addition, The adjudicator can, quotes, meet and question any of the parties to the contract and their representatives, make such site visits and inspections as he considers appropriate, and carry out tests or experiment. To conclude on this point, I would suggest that within the confines of the existing process, adjudicators can and should make better use of the initiative afforded to them, bearing in mind the decision is likely to become the long-term basis for the resolution of the dispute, and the aim is to do justice to the dispute. My next heading and topic is timing. One area that has not been resolved with any clarity concerns the tension between the 28 or 42 day time limit and the volume of material which needs to be properly digested in order to reach a fair and just resolution of the dispute. The court has yet to find any case which it decides is too voluminous to enable a decision fairly to be reached. Records of resignations by adjudicators on this basis are also few and far between. Is this such a bad thing? I would suggest not. My experience is that with a little encouragement from the adjudicator, parties are often prepared to agree extensions of time commensurate with the size and complexity of the dispute. Why? Well, for those who want this method of dispute resolution to constitute a decent attempt to arrive at a fair resolution of the competing positions, more time is always welcome. Time and again, I have persuaded parties that the quality of the decision they will get from me will improve with time, allowing for the process to run its course. Once they have that on board, it is rather easier for them to grant more time for the response and the reply, and dare I say it, hold the occasional meeting. 
In addition, and this is an important feature, a responding party who is given enough time to do justice to the defense he seeks to advance is a respondent less likely to issue legal proceedings for final determination if he ultimately loses. The Bayes consultation process, to which I shall shortly return again, observed that 28 days was typically descri described as providing a starting point, but flexibility was required to deal with every type of dispute. All parties, including adjudicators, want to achieve a fair decision, so will normally agree to an extension of time. Of course, routine elongation of the process is not appropriate and certainly would not be in a simple dispute about interim cash flow. But as we know, adjudication is about much more than that. So this is an area where the ability of the parties to adjust the mandatory timescales has, I believe, served the industry well. I encapsulate it by saying it is a one size fits all, but with adjustable straps. My next heading is areas for statutory improvement, question mark. Although 25 years have passed since the inception of the Act, it was subject to amendments, as we know, which became effective in 2011. Time has now moved on. And in 2018, a review was undertaken by Bayes. The object of the consultation was to review the 2011 amendments the overall framework of adjudication and its affordability. What I found telling was the fact that there were very few participants in the consultation process. There is no record of responses from many of the AMBs and the online portal attracted only 54 responses. This rather suggests to me that there is no real appetite for change within the adjudication community. Indeed, the consultation summary itself acknowledges that it its conclusions should be treated, or its summary should be treated as indicative rather than fully representative of the range of views within the industry. Well, I actually couldn't work out what the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy does. So I did a drop down menu search on Google uh, to uh, ask what, the, what it does. And the answer was, uh, it is for building a stronger, greener future by fighting coronavirus, tackling climate change, unleashing innovation and making the UK a great place to work and do business. It is, you may think, ironic that it took some two years before Bayes unleashed its summary of responses to the consultation, uh, they becoming available uh, only um, uh, recently. Nonetheless, Page 29 of the consultation assures us that the department will now take forward the post-implementation review. And the then minister, Nadim Zadawi's forward, also promises that the information provided during the review will be used to inform the development of the post-implementation review. Well, this sounds like kicking it down the road to me. Uh, and it's hard to see any legislative changes being proposed anytime soon. But that may be as it should be. If adjudication is generally regarded as a success, then making the UK a great place to work and do business may mean not changing the system at all. Yet there is one key area where the courts have from time to time recommended change and it arises out of the jurisdictional exclusion of the process industries in section 105. Two re relatively recent cases have again highlighted this. Uh, ironically, they both concern the same site where the plant in the course of construction was designed both to process waste and to generate power. In one of the two cases, it was said that the act applied in full because processing of waste was the primary activity, not power generation. In the other case, it was accepted that the site was outside the remit of the Act, which gave rise to an analysis of how the payment notice regime within the Act applied to hybrid contracts. In C. Spencer and MW High Tech, Lord Justice Coulson said, unfortunately, the Act is not as comprehensive as it might have been. 
It was suggested during the parliamentary debates that the then government was, in the words of Lord Howey of Troon, got at by some big, powerful, important interests in what are called the process industries. They yielded to those pressures and in doing so lost sight of the aim of the bill. Whatever the reason for it, many contracts for works which on any sensible definition are construction operations were excluded from the ambit of the act. In the other case relating to the same site, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell said, there is a powerful argument for the ambit of the adjudication provisions in the 1996 Act to be reconsidered following more than 20 years of statutory adjudication and having regard to developments in construction related industries. However, as currently enacted, the purpose of section 105.2 is, is to exempt certain industries from the mandatory adjudication and payment regimes imposed by the 1996 Act. One of the exempt industries is the power generation industry." End quotes. Cases about hybrid contracts have invariably given rise to difficulties. And despite these and early entreaties from the courts to remove the distinction, there still seems to be no legislative appetite to do so. That said, the Bayes consultation paper calls for a review of the exclusion of a process plant. So we must wait and see if that transpires. The golden jubilee perhaps. Another interesting suggestion in the Bayes paper is that with advancement in offsite manufacture for construction, uh, consideration should be given to broadening the definition of construction operations in that respect. My next heading is true value. Uh, as many of you will know, one area in which I have a particular interest is the right of the paying party who failed to serve payment notices to subsequently run a true value adjudication once he has paid the notified sum. The regime of notices has been a welcome addition to the armory. It is a basic matter of commercial fairness that a paying party should be obliged to explain how much he proposes to pay and why, and that he should do so within a given time limit. The explanation required for the calculation need not be extensive or complex, but should be appropriate to suit the circumstances. Even if a paying party does not comply with the notice regime, the payee who could in fact raise a smash and grab adjudication may choose not to do so for commercial reasons, but will instead prefer to negotiate with an employer who has his arm tied behind his back. That is surely a clear benefit of the process. Whether or not you agree with the s and and Grove decision, it is undoubtedly a failure of the parliamentary drafting of the Act not to have provided a clear answer on such a fundamental issue. Happily though, the Court of Appeal has now clarified the position. What initially surprised me is that the commencement of a true value adjudication has remained a relatively unusual step even in the three years since s and was first decided at first instance. There are few, if any, decided cases which record a true value adjudication as having happened. And yet there are countless examples of paying parties not managing to serve valid notices on time. There are some obvious explanations for the lack of true value adjudications. First, in most cases, the position can be rectified in a subsequent payment cycle, so no long-term harm is done. And that is obviously uh, easier to achieve early on in the process when it is possible to take a pragmatic view. It is, however, less likely when the works have largely been completed and the gap between the party's perceptions as to true value has widened. So the other explanation is that the parties end up negotiating on the true value against the backdrop of the obligation on the paying party to pay the notified sum. In other words, the mere threat of the true value adjudication is sufficient to open up discussions and for the payee to take a more realistic view of some of the weaker elements of his claim. If correct, these ex examples are, uh, these explanations are examples of the system regulating itself and working well without input from an adjudicator. Or to pick up on Lord Briggs's observation, it is another example of the availability of adjudication 
meaning that disputes are speedily settled between the parties without the need ever to invoke the adjudication process. My next heading is costs. A fundamental characteristic of the adjudication process is that while both parties are legally responsible for payment of the adjudicator's fees, no legal costs are payable by the losing party. The process was designed as a cheap and quick fix, uncomplicated by provision for recovery of lawyer's fees. In his book on construction adjudication, Sir Peter Coulson observes that, quotes, this result can create considerable hardship to the ultimately successful party. Many adjudications involve a whole raft of complex issues and can require teams of lawyers and experts working flat out to deal with numerous points that have arisen within the tight timetable of an adjudication. In John Roberts against Park Care Homes, uh, Park Care Homes Number Two Limited, Lord Justice May said, and I quote. It is commonplace that some construction contract adjudications are fiercely adversarial and expensive. It is commercially unsurprising if some parties, by adopting a standard amendment to a standard form, give the adjudicator a jurisdiction to direct the payment of legal costs. Well, it may be commercially un unsurprising, yet it is very rare in my experience. The standard forms make no such provision, and parties seldom agree to make such a change to displace the status quo. At the risk of overgeneralization, that may be because at the time of contracting, the employer considers he is most likely to be the unsuccessful paying party, and the contractor does not have the temerity to ask for a change to the standard form. So simply doing nothing works well for both of them. That is no bad thing, it's another good example of the market regulating itself in which everyone knows where they stand. The subject of costs was however, one area which was looked at during the Bayes consultation, although the questions primarily sought to establish whether the amendments to the act had increased costs rather than what might be changed, if anything, in respect of costs generally. My sense is that we will not see radical change here either. My last topic is residential occupiers. Quite rightly, Parliament decided to exclude them from the ambit of the Act. The Act was designed to apply to regular players in the industry, not someone who wants a kitchen extension built at the back of their house. H have the courts achieved the right balance here? Well, Sir Peter Coulson's book points out that the importance of section 106 has diminished over the years, as all the standard forms of contract have included adjudication provisions. This means that the employer will have contracted for adjudication, even if pursuant to the statute, he would otherwise have been exempt. Leaving aside that practical point, the book identifies a string of cases in which the court has invariably taken a restrictive approach to the statutory exemption thus broadening the remit of adjudication as far as possible. The most recent case, actually dating back to 2013, is one about which Sir Peter Coulson expresses the hope that it will be the last on section 106. That concerned the question of whether the intention should, to occupy should be tested at a snapshot in time, or as the judge concluded, was an ongoing question in respect of which the date of contract was obviously the most important. The judicial restriction of the ambit of section 106 has not, however, acquired universal approval. In that respect, I, I commend to you a paper by Abdul Janadu of Keating Chambers, uh, graphically entitled The Gutting of Section 106, which concludes that the TCC has effectively rendered such section 106 redundant initially by limiting the statutory definition, and then by finding far too easily that the house owner has unwittingly submitted to the jurisdiction of the adjudicator. The unspoken rationale for giving section 106 a restrictive meaning uh, is, that pres is presumably that adjudication is such a marvelous thing that even the lay public should be able to enjoy its benefits. If that is the case, 
I too would question its justification. Adjudication generally benefits the payee, i.e. the contractor, not the payer, i.e. the employer. There is no real evidence that domestic employers are guilty of starving their wily contractors of cash flow during the project. Rather, my own direct experience and personal experience uh, is that down payments are required in order to persuade the contractor to turn up at all. I said that the residential occupier was the last topic. I see I have a, one more to add, which is transparency. Lit litigation is a public process. Uh, arbitration is a private process, often chosen by the parties for that very reason. Adjudication is essentially a confidential process. There appears to be some appetite for that to change. In the Bayes paper, some 44% believe there should be greater transparency. For my part, I'm content with the status quo. It is, the mandatory, it is a mandatory dispute resolution process, and parties should be able to have their disputes resolved in private in those circumstances. I doubt that much benefit will be gained by publishing anonymized decisions, since many will be fact sensitive and of limited wider benefit. Finally then, I now summarize some of my uh, key conclusions in, I think, six bullet points. First, the powers granted by the Act are rightly regarded as having successfully achieved their intended objective of unlocking cash flow. Second, Merely because most decisions are never subject to final determination, it should not be assumed that parties have invariably agreed with the correctness of the decision. In many cases, there will be other factors at play. The mere fact of the decision is one of those. Third, as the architecture of the process is heavily rigged in favor of the claiming party, it behoves us all to decide the disputes fairly and independently, with no predisposition towards the referring party. Four, better use can and should be made of the power to take the initiative in, in, in investigating the facts. For example, it is not unfair to probe and test either party's case by requesting documents. Fifth, in many respects, the market regulates itself in light of the legislative framework. Examples of this include the ability of the parties to agree extensions to the timetable to suit the case, the balancing of the payment notice requirements with the right to a true value repayment, and the exclusion of any obligation to pay legal costs. Lastly, the Act could be extended to include the process industries. Beyond that, there appears to be no real appetite for legislative change, even if the <laughs> residential occupiers seems, at, to me at least, somewhat questionable. So is it time for a silver jubilee? I think we can allow some modest bunting and a slice of Victoria sponge. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> Alexander, thank you very much indeed. We've got time for some questions, and a few have come in. The, the first question that I can see is that there have been many cases involving the Construction Act, and there have been many turning points in the common law. If you had to isolate the key turning points or key cases, what would they be, in your view? Um, I... I must, of course, include MACOB. Um, I, I suppose I would bookend um, um, my answer with the first and, and, and most recent significant, um, the first bookend being MACOB um, for setting up the process, for giving the clear steer that the TCC will lend its hand to uh, the uh, enforcement. Um, so that would be my, my first one. Uh, Carillion in Devonport for setting the high bar on um, resisting enforcement, encouraging people not to cast around. Um, Grove, I guess I would say that, wouldn't I, um, on payment notices um, and, and um, true value. 
really as being something of such fundamental commercial importance. Um, what else? Carillion, Carillion and uh, Ervasco uh, um, on on natural justice because it 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 really gave uh, or made it very clear that it's got to be something very material, mm -hmm. but breach of natural justice. So again, setting the bar very high. And and lastly, I would bookend it with Bresco uh, as really mm -hmm. rising for our next twenty five years how and setting in stone how we think uh, adjudication is bearing. Sure, no, thank you. And, and the second question is, in your view, what do you think is driving this inertia or reluctance to really get to grips with taking the initiative, as you, as you explained earlier? Uh, what's driving it or what's causing the problem? I, I suspect, um, there's just a nervousness about going going alone on it because it's not it's not something that's 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 happened and people are doing it. Um, scales are tight. Obviously, if you if you start asking people for documents, I accept that that would involve um, giving them time to find them, to produce them, uh, and may uh, have an impact on the process. So there's a value judgment to be made there. Um, but if it becomes more routine, then um, a, a momentum will, will um, um, I suppose, establish itself. Um, my dim and distant memory um, uh, of adjudication itself going back 25 years is actually the whole process was quite to take off. Parties didn't say, ha ha, well, we must use this right. There was, uh, it was quite a slow take up. So people moved move gently and I think that um, I suppose it's just um, a, 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 an idea that needs to catch on I can't, and time is the only, shortness of time is probably the only one I can think of. Sure and the final question is in just looking ahead what do you think is left in terms of case law you know we've covered uh, breaches of natural justice, severance, sort of all the procedural issues are pretty much well documented. What, what do you think is left in the next decade or so? Not, there isn't really a, a huge amount of um, uh, law to be developed. Uh, I mean, the basic, um, if, if we were to look at our, our, our curve of, of, of the development of the law, um, it's definitely declining um, because the, the the structure and the framework uh, is there. Um, not to say that there won't be litigation. Parties can always litigate about the application of facts of a given dispute to the existing law. But I don't think that we'll see very much more, um, uh, or certainly not at the same rate, um, uh, of development of, of cases because because it's a declining declining scale. Um, sure, no, th Alexander. Thank you very very much indeed. It's just a shame we can't give you a round of round of applause, but <laughs> I'm very very grateful. Thank you very much indeed.